Genesis chapter 3 in your Bible with me as Brother Falls passes out our newest installment in our lessons regarding the doctrines of Calvinism. Let me introduce the lesson tonight by uh, relating to you an anecdote for uh, someone else to take that position. I said, well, I said, what was the issue? And he said, well, he said, it boiled down to this. He said, the young man, he said, we got him out of Bible college. And he said, the young man is a thoroughgoing Calvinist. And he was pushing Calvinism in the church and among the young people. Now, what a silly thing to push among young people. What a, and I've never understood. And I said to this pastor, I said, Pastor, do you see, he's been in the ministry far longer than I. I think he's been in the ministry nearly 30 years. He said, I said, Pastor, do you see any practical purpose of anyone pushing the doctrines of Calvinism? What could it possibly do to be a benefit to a church? And he kind of shook his head, uh, and, and he said, no, he said, there's nothing, nothing, nothing that Calvinism can do that would be a benefit. And so we talked a little bit longer, uh, and at any rate, this young man is leaving. Well, he had asked the young man, who he said, did the college you go to, he said, he said, did the college you go to, they claim that they don't push Calvinism at this school. He said, did the Bible college you go to, did, did they push Calvinism? And that young man said, it was taught in all the Bible courses. Now this alarms me. This alarms me. A good a college, a small college, but a good college, and it alarms me very much that this influence is here. You see, preacher, where did it come from? It is coming from the, the halls of academia, from higher education. It has been seeping through the cracks at certain theological seminaries in the Midwest for a number of years, and by the process of kind of a trickle-down effect, is now entering the Bible colleges, will enter the churches, and will have a chilling effect upon the churches. Calvinism does not typically build anything. Now, uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 3, and we'll begin at verse number 6. I'm just going to give you some background tonight. We're going to delve into the points of Calvinism, what they believe and what does the Bible say. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. The Bible says, And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, of course, speaking of the tree in the midst of the Garden of Eden, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she, this is Eve, took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he, that is Adam, did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave to me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Then beginning in verse 14 and through, uh, really for, through around verse 21, we find God's curse upon man. This is, of course, the story of the fall of man. This is the story of the point at which mankind was plunged into sin. Adam and Eve were created and placed in a garden. They were created morally neutral, placed in the garden and given a choice to choose whether they would select good and obedience to God or whether they would select evil and rebellion. The choice, by the way, was something that they made of their own free will. Now, I want you to listen carefully. God did not program them to make the wrong choice. Did you hear what I said? God did not program them to make the wrong choice. Now, Calvinism teaches that he did. I want you to understand this. You say, well, then, Pastor, that would make God responsible for sin. Extreme Calvinism preaches that God is responsible for sin. We'll get into that uh, eventually. But they made the wrong choice. Adam, as our federal head then, according to Romans chapter 5, plunged the human race into the sinful condition in which we now find ourselves. And so this is the story of how mankind fell in a sinful condition and, of course, eventually would be redeemed uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the outline because we're going to deal with the first point. And you'll notice the title, my subtitle, Total Depravity. Remember we, had, we described last time that the points of Calvinism uh, can be summed up in the, uh, uh, the anacronym, a tulip, T-U-L-I-P. We talked about that. We're going to deal with the first point tonight. That is the point known as total depravity. 
depravity in our sense of thinking in, in our church and in the broader sense of evangelicalism or fundamentalism would carry with it the idea of sinful. If an individual is a depraved individual, that means they are sinful. And it also carries with it the concept of being bent towards sin. So someone would say, well, Pastor, now you've just read in the book of Genesis where Adam plunged the whole human race into sin. You have just said that the word depravity means to be sin sinful and to have a bent towards sinning. So wouldn't it stand to reason that mankind is depraved based upon his sinful condition? The answer to that is an emphatic yes. Mankind is depraved because of his sinful condition. Oh, well then, Pastor, you agree with the first point of Calvinism. The answer to that is an emphatic no. Because as taught by John Calvin and his followers, depravity, as they understand it, is far more than man's sinfulness of nature and his sinfulness of choice. It goes beyond man even having the opportunity to make a choice. And man's depravity, as we'll see in a moment, is defined by John Calvin and other current Calvinists as complete inability to ever choose right or to ever choose God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is a, an extreme difference between the concept of a sinful nature and, in, and inability. We'll get into that in a moment. Look at your lesson outline, please, beginning at the introduction. The errors incumbent in the five points of Calvinism are easily identified when one contrasts the teachings of Calvinism to the teaching of Scripture. Well, some of the five points may appear to have scriptural foundation, just as we said a moment ago, total depravity appears to. It will be shown that all five points, as taught by leading Calvinists, lack scriptural merit. We begin our tiptoeing through the tulips with the letter T for total depravity. Okay, first, before I get into what John Calvin taught and his followers taught subsequently, we need to understand what the Bible teaches. We've read the passage from Genesis chapter 3. The biblical doctrine of the sinfulness of man. Point A. The Bible teaches that man has been a fallen creature. A fallen creature since Adam's transgression in the Garden of Eden. A, a fallen creature. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is the problem with mankind today. We are a fallen creature. We are not a creature that is evolving to a higher social function. We are actually a creature that is just one slim line away from barbarism. You say, oh, but pastor, we are so civilized in our day and time. It is amazing how rapidly our quote-unquote civilization and the structures of our civilization can disintegrate when lawlessness prevails. And we've seen that in some great tragedies in our uh, American history, even in recent days when there's no rule of law. It is amazing how rapidly people turn back to the rule of the jungle. And they, the, supposed, uh, the supposed restraints of civilization mean nothing to them anymore, and they throw those things off very rapidly. That is certainly the case. Uh, man is not inherently good. By the way, you cannot rear children properly if you believe that man is inherently good. My kids are not inherently good. And by the way, Mom and Dad, be careful of this. Don't defend your children. When they do wrong, punish them for the wrong that they do. Oh, well, Pastor, you don't understand. My kid would never even dream of doing thus and so. Oh, yes, he would. Okay, I guarantee it. Well, but Pastor, in this particular instance, he, had absolutely, he didn't do a thing that was wrong. Okay, maybe not in that particular instance. But there were many other particular instances that he didn't get caught for. So if once in a while you spank a kid for a particular instance where he really wasn't in the wrong, uh, just tell him, listen, that's for your bank account and you're still way ahead. Understand that. Kids get by. Kids get by. You preach, how do you know that? Don't you remember what it was like to be a kid? You know what you got by with, okay? You know you didn't get nearly what you deserve. And um, at any rate, we understand that man is a fallen creature. That is why we deal with man as a fallen creature. If man were not a fallen creature, we would not need to have laws. If man were not a fallen creature, we wouldn't have rules. We wouldn't have to have standards. Everyone would automatically do what is right, but certainly that is not the case. Mankind fell into sin when Adam transgressed. Continuing at point A, the New Testament declares that Adam's transgression passed upon all men, ensuring that all are sinners by nature. Turn to Romans chapter 5. I want you to see the verse. 
Romans chapter 5. We've looked at Genesis chapter 3. Romans chapter 5 confirms this. Romans 5, verse number 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man, this is Adam, speaking of Adam, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now watch in verse number 12, there are two ideas of the sinfulness of man. Number one, man inheriting a sinful nature from Adam. As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Preacher, how did death pass upon all men? Because number one, sin entered the world to our federal head, Adam. Adam, as the representative of the human race, sinned. All of us in Adam sinned. He is the federal head of the race. And the Bible teaches that death, because of sin, passed upon all men. Then the last part of the verse says this, "...for that all have sinned." Not only sinners by nature, having inherited the sin nature from Adam, the bent toward wrongdoing, that is adequately demonstrated in the fact that you never have to teach a child how to lie. They learn that on their own. Why? Because they have a sinful nature. They are bent toward sinning. Mankind is sinful. Mankind is bent toward sinning. That based upon his nature. But look at the outworking of the nature, the end of verse number 12. For that all have sinned. That is the action. The first part is the nature we inherit. The second part is the action or the sins that we commit. All of us commit sin. So we have a sinful nature and we are all sinners. That is exactly what the Bible teaches. In no way does my speaking against the interpretation of Calvinism minimize my view of the sinfulness of man. I understand the Bible's plain teaching on that. Point B, despite any apparent goodness in individuals, the Bible declares that, quote, all have sinned and that there are in reality no naturally righteous, put the word righteous, no naturally righteous individuals. That is the case. When I used to say, but pastor, what about moral people? I will give you there are moral people, but they do not live up to the standard of God. Well, what about just decent people? I will grant to you that by the standards of men, there are decent people, but they do not live up to the standards of God. Remember, we do not compare ourselves, compare ourselves among ourselves. It is God to whom we compare. And when we match ourselves against God, the best among us falls woefully short of God's perfect standard. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This preacher, what is wrong with this nation, this world today? This world is infected by sin. What is tragic today is sin is no longer shameful. It is glorified. The things that used to be viewed or thought of or even considered with a sense of embarrassment today are paraded publicly. And in great measure, because Christian people have been so silent as to the issues of our day and time, this recent move, this holiday season, and I know it's been brewing in the background for, for some years, but this move, this holiday season, to eliminate the greeting Merry Christmas. How many of you have heard about this? And you know what I'm doing? When people wish me a happy holiday, someone did today. I paused and I turned and I said, no, I said, it's Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Now, there is a website I recently heard about. Uh, I think it's Grinch.com or something. I'm not sure of the uh, address. And if you don't get it right, you won't find it. They are listing all of the corporations, including Home Depot, by the way. I was surprised by that. They're listing all of the corporations that have commanded their employees to use the greeting Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas on this website. And what, they're, what the argument is this. Don't patronize those companies because they are trying to make money off of Christmas and yet won't let you use the word Christmas. Well, that makes sense to me. It's, it's ridiculous. Happy holidays. Just reply to people, Merry Christmas. And if people need a further uh, definition of that, explain to them that we are celebrating the birth of Christ. I was in a store today and, and, uh, and engaged a clerk in a conversation I gave him one of my gospel tracts and I was just chatting with him for just a second in conversation. He really wanted to talk longer. And he said, so he said, you're a Christian. He said, what is your idea about Saddam Hussein's capture? <laughs> oh, don't you love it when someone asks you a question? I said, well, I'm thankful for it. And I said, I hope they turn him over to his own countrymen. Those people know how to deal with it. And he said, well, the store clerk said, he said well, he said, I just... He said, I just don't think we should go in there and uh, march into that country and, and, and because we feel threatened, take it.
make it over. He said, I just don't see any reason for that. Ooh, ooh, he was engaging me in a discussion. I said, well, listen, I said, if, if our president determined that the country of Cuba posed some kind of a threat to the United States, I said, we should bomb the guts out of it. And those were my exact words, my exact words. Merry Christmas, by the way. And uh, for the simple reason this, I am a realist. I am a realist. When those terrorists strike, they're going to kill our flesh and blood here in America, and we did nothing to hurt them. We did nothing to hurt them. So if you have to squash them like a bug every once in a while, praise the Lord for our president. And by the way, Diane Sawyer was really trying to nail him the other night in that interview, and our president, I love what he said. He looked her square in the eye, and he said, Diane, he said, you can ask that question all you want. I did what was right for America. And uh, amen to that. I felt good about that. By the way, did you hear about the, the lady who... Um, her husband uh, was, was taken sick. They rushed him, to the, rushed him to the hospital. He had kind of, I guess it was stroke-like symptoms. They rushed him to the hospital, emergency room. She was out waiting in the emergency room. The doctor came into the, or in the waiting room. The doctor came into the waiting room. Grave, grave look on his face. He said, ma'am, he said, he said, I'm so sorry. His heart is still beating, but his brain is dead. And she said, oh, she said, this is terrible. We've never had a liberal in the family before. <laughs> All right, moving right along. <laughs> Heart still beating, brain dead, get it? Okay, and <laughs> it took a while, didn't it? Back to what we were talking about. The sinfulness of man. The Bible says that all have sinned. Sin is our problem. That is our problem. Point number two, the nature of sin. What is sin? Well, let's find out. As defined by the Bible, the Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law, L-A-W, the law. That is the violating or the breaking of God's law. That is sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. Point B, sin is falling short of God's glory, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it is falling short of God's glory. Doesn't that include us all? Certainly we have all transgressed God's law. We have all fallen short of God's glory. C, letter C, sin involves turning from God's way to one's own way. Isaiah 53, 6, we have turned everyone to his own way. It is turning out of the path of God. It is going in aberrant direction from the way that God would have us to go. That is sin. Sin, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 17, includes all unrighteousness. And you say, preacher, what is unrighteousness? Righteousness is simply this. When one meets his obligations, he is righteous. Okay, that is the, that is the, that is the um, uh, uh, shoe leather definition for righteousness. When one meets his obligations, unrighteousness then is a failure to meet my obligations. I am unrighteous when I fail to meet my obligations both to God and to man. All unrighteousness, all failure to meet my obligation, all failure to live up to the standard that God has established to me, for me, all of those things are things are sin. So sin includes all unrighteousness. And then point E, sin involves a lack of faith. Sin involves a lack of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we have just an overview how uh, all-encompassing is sin. Now understand, mankind is a sinner by nature. Mankind is a sinner by choice. We have sinned against the Lord. We are all sinners. Let's summarize this sin. Summarize, man is sinful by nature as a result of Adam's fall, and man is sinful by choice as a result of willfully sinning, whether sins of, com sins of commission or sins of omission. This biblical view of man's sinfulness is only the beginning of Calvin's teaching. Now, this is biblical. Everything I've taught is correct so far. But Calvin went way beyond what the Bible says. Indeed, Calvinism teaches not only man's sinfulness, but also man's complete inability to do anything right, including to believe the gospel. Put the word believe there. Man's complete inability to do anything, including to believe the gospel. Augustine taught it. John Calvin echoed it that although the gospel was to be preached to all the world, that we were to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, there was no creature who could believe. That no one could, in the hearing of the gospel, stir his heart to faith and trust Christ for salvation. That that was absolutely impossible and that no one, that no one in the world was capable of any form of belief. And he's a preacher, that's astounding. It is, and we'll see how they get around it in just a moment. By the way, when we talk about Calvin's view of inability, 
There is not one verse anywhere, anywhere in the Bible that would back this concept. It is a logical conclusion based upon the rest of their theological, uh, theological system. Look at point number three. Calvinism's view of total depravity, it is the total inability to believe. The canons of Dort, and we talked about Dort last week where the Calvinists met and they kind of summarized their belief system. The canons of Dort say this, Therefore, all men, without the regenerating grace of the Holy Spirit, are neither able, put the word able there, are neither able nor willing to return to God, nor to dispose themselves to reformation. Now, apart from regenerating grace, you are not able to believe, essentially is what that says. Apart from regenerating grace. Now, oh, wait a minute, preacher, I thought... You first believed, and then you were regenerated. You thought right. You must first believe. But, the Calvinist says, no, no. You cannot believe until you have first been regenerated. Now, folks, this is, I know, I know, I know, I know. You look at me and say, preacher, do these people really believe this? Yes, they do. There are volumes written to this effect. We'll get into it on this second page. Note the, note the top. Notice, it is unreasonable to state that a person is, quote, unwilling, put the word unwilling there, is unwilling to do what he is not able to do. That's just unreasonable, that statement from the canons of Dort. It is unreasonable to state that a person is unwilling to do what he is not able to do. I am not able to fly like a bird, but I don't know if I'd be willing to if I could. In fact, I rather venture to say that although I don't like heights, if I could fly like a bird, I'd probably be willing to try at least once. But because I can't, it is un illogical to say that I'm unwilling. If I'm not able to do something, how do I know if I'm willing to do so or not? That's a silly statement uh, in that ancient uh, or that very old um, doctrinal statement of faith. Point two, according to Hunt, this is Dave Hunt I'm speaking of now, quote, Calvinism is guilty of both absurdity and injustice by declaring man to be incapable of repentance and faith than condemning him for failing to repent and believe. And that is exactly what Calvinism does. Exactly. You say, preacher, how in the world did they do it? Well, look at point B. Calvinist Frank Beck states this concerning mankind. He is free to turn to Christ, but not able. Put the word able there. Now, isn't that ridiculous? So I, as a gospel preacher, am urging folk to come forward and trust Christ as their Savior. But when I urge them to turn to Christ for salvation, I am telling them to do something that according to the Calvinists, they cannot do. By the way, that's why a lot of those churches don't give an invitation. It's one of the reasons. That's why you very rarely see that. Now, I know there are exceptions, and I understand the exceptions, and there's some good exceptions. And there are some folks, there are some folks that claim to be Calvinists in their doctrine and are totally and completely different in their practice. They don't practice it. They just claim to believe it in their, their mind, but they are soul winners. I understand that, but that is the exception. What Calvinism teaches is this, that you cannot make a decision to trust Christ as Savior. What would be the sense of preaching the Gospel to all the world if people cannot, by their very nature, believe? Well, Pastor, what would be the sense? Well, we'll find out in a moment how they deal with this. Point C. Although the Bible never states that man is unable to believe the gospel, leading Calvinists Talbot and Crampton, and they've written a whole book about this, have written, quote, The Bible stresses the total inability of fallen man to respond to the things of God. Does the Bible stress that? Can that be found in the Bible? What about the invitation, Look unto me, all ye lands, and be ye saved? What about that? What about the invitation, whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life freely? What about the invitation, uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Do those verses of the Bible that invite us to turn to God, do they anywhere indicate our inability to turn to God? In both the Old and the New Testaments, when God, let's use the Old Testament as an example, when God in the Minor Prophets is pleading with His people and saying, Return to Me, O Israel! Is God pleading in vain? Is God asking for something that they are incapable of accomplishing? Absolutely not. Throughout the Bible, we have God inviting people to Him, inviting His people back to Him. And there is not one hint anywhere in the Bible that man is unable to turn to God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please listen. God created you 
as a free moral agent with a free will. And you may choose Him or reject Him. If you choose Him, you are saved. If you reject Him, you are lost. And your rejection of Christ is your personal responsibility. No one forced you into it. God did not sit in heaven and say, Well, I think I will, um, I think I will give Pastor Falls the ability to believe. We'll get to that in a moment. I'll give Pastor Falls the ability to believe, but this David Joyner guy over here, I won't give him that ability because after all, I, 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 there's something about Falls I kind of like and this David guy, I don't know so much about him. God didn't do that. But that is exactly what the Calvinist teaches so that he would be incapable or unable of ever turning to God. Well, then let me ask you something. If he is inherently unable, cannot turn to God, what sense does it make for me to tell him about the Gospel and say, you know, David, if you'll put your faith and trust in Christ, you can be saved. I'm lying if I tell him that. And yet I'm commanded to preach the Gospel. I can't tell whether he's quote-unquote one of the elect. I can't tell that. And so I'm giving a promise to a man who could never repent and believe the Gospel because he is incapable of faith. Is there one verse in the Bible that teaches this? No, not one. In fact, the Bible over and over again, though our faith, what did Jesus say? Though your faith is as a grain of mustard seed. Mustard seed, very, very tiny. It is faith nonetheless. Not one verse of Scripture teaches then that it is impossible for a man to make a decision to turn to Christ, although the Calvinists do teach that. Point D, because of man's supposed inability to believe the Gospel, Calvinism teaches... Now now listen to this, folks. Calvinism teaches that regeneration precedes salvation. Now, I'm not making this up. I am not making this up. Okay, Pastor Falls over here, let's say, is one of the elect. And so it, he can't believe, though, because he doesn't have the ability naturally to believe. Now, David Joyner over here, he's as lost as a goat. But over here, Pastor Falls is one of the elect. Ah, because he's one of the elect. He is infused with the ability to believe. He is regenerated. Listen, listen. He is, quote, born again before he has ever believed on Christ. That is exactly what Calvinism teaches. Oh, preacher, I can't... Listen, read their writings. We'll get into some of it. Just R.C. Sproul in just a moment. We'll quote him in just a moment. Edwin, Edwin Palmer asserts, quote, Once he, that is the sinner, is born again, he can for the first time turn to Jesus, asking Jesus to save him. Now, folks, this is bizarre. You say, well, Pastor, now wait. We've been, we've been in evangelical fundamental circles all our lives. And we've been told you must be born again. And we've been told, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we've been told, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. What? That whosoever believeth on Him should not perish. We've been told that all these years. Yes, you have. And all of those things are correct. And those things are from the Bible. But Calvinism teaches that you're born again before you're saved. Why do you have to be born again before you're saved? Because you are unable to believe. Is this born again experience prior to salvation something that you notice? No. Is it something that you know you have? No. Is it something that comes by virtue of the preaching of the Gospel? No. It is something that the Calvinist teaches is bestowed upon you at some point in time unbeknownst to yourself. By the way, once that is bestowed upon you, you will eventually get saved no matter what. You cannot turn the Gospel down. You cannot say no. Let me ask you a question. Why wouldn't God simply bestow that grace upon everybody so that all could be saved? After all, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. A loving God would certainly bestow that grace upon all, and then all would turn to Christ. The Calvinist does not teach that is so. It is only certain people. You don't know when it happens, but it happens. And for the Calvinist, you can be born again without being saved, but you'll eventually get saved. Point two. Famous Reformed Bible teacher R.C. Sproul states this, quote, A cardinal point of Reformed theology is the maxim, Regeneration precedes faith. Now, R.C. Sproul teaches that. I have one of his books at home where he teaches that. Regeneration precedes faith. That means you're saved before you even have faith. 
Point three, since total depravity requires regeneration before faith and salvation, some Calvinists assume that it, that is regeneration, takes place in infancy. In infancy. Okay? So these infant children are born again, though they don't know it. Now, I used to preach, you're making fun. I'm trying not to make fun. But there are serious theologians that believe this. And ladies and gentlemen, it is heresy of the first rank. It is heresy. Infant children are not born again. By the way, part of this is where we have what they call the quote-unquote covenant of baptism. You can search your Bible through cover to cover. I'll give you $10,000 if you find one instance in the Bible where an infant was baptized. You won't find it anywhere in the Scripture. It's simply not there. Well, well what, why would they have a covenant of baptism? Because Calvinism teaches that the children of believing parents or Calvinistic parents are automatically elect. And so they're baptized in covenant relationship to God when they're infant children shortly after their birth. And again, this is a confusion of the act of circumcision, which was something that happened to infant male children in Israel. It is a confusion of the rite of circumcision with the act of baptism. And circumcision of the Old Testament was for Israel. Baptism is for the New Testament church. The two are completely different, and the one did not replace the other. Israel is not the church. And the church is not Israel. So the one is not a replacement for the other. Of course, um, I continue. Point three, since total depravity requires regeneration before faith and salvation, some Calvinists assume it takes place in infancy. The Bible says absolutely no such thing. R.C. Sproul writes, quote, The Reformed view of predestination teaches that before a person can choose Christ, he must be born again. One does not first believe and then become reborn. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! The Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say, well, you know, I'm not sure how you're going to be saved because I'm not sure if you're one of the elect. And I don't know if you've been born again. You know, you have to be born again before you're, you can be saved. There's not one verse anywhere in the Bible that teaches this gobbledygook. You say, preacher, then why are so many people drawn into this? Let me explain. There is an intellectual appeal to Calvinism that is very, very strong, particularly in institutions of higher education, However, to me, it is illogical and most certainly unscriptural. Look at point E. According to Jesus, however, man's refusal to turn to God is a result of man's unwillingness, not his inability. Turn to John chapter 5. I want you to see this. This is so important. The words of Scripture are so important. John chapter 5, verse number 40. John 5 and verse 40. Of course, Jesus here is talking about uh, the fact that He is the Son of God. He is bearing witness uh, in John chapter 5. But in verse 40, He says something very significant. John 5 and verse 40, Jesus said, And ye will not come to Me, that ye might have life. He rebukes His audience. He says, You're rejecting Me. You will not come to Me, that ye might have life. According to Jesus, man's refusal to turn to God is a result of man's unwillingness, not inability. Jesus said, ye will not come to me. He did not say, ye cannot come to me. Does everyone understand that? If I hold someone accountable for something they cannot do, if I punish someone for failing to do something that they cannot do anyway, I am unjust. The Calvinist makes God unjust. If David Joyner here cannot come to Christ. He cannot. And yet he is commanded repent or perish. But he cannot come to Christ because of his inability, because he has not been given this special grace, this being born again before you're saved bit. If, if he cannot turn to Christ, and I yet command him, and the Gospel says, believe and be saved, repent or perish, and he cannot come, then who am I to hold him accountable for something he cannot do? That is ridiculous. And what in the world would be the point of preaching the Gospel to every creature if only a select few even have the ability to believe? May I say that by logical extension in the system of Calvinism, all soul winning would be a waste of time because the vast majority of people could not turn to Christ anyway according to that system of Calvinism. What a silly 
And by the way, you just don't find it in the Bible. And if you think you can, show me later, but you won't. Point F, as Calvinism teaches, one cannot believe apart from being regenerated and God regenerates certain individuals in order that they uh, might believe. Why doesn't a loving and compassionate God regenerate all people that all might believe? Well, why not? Oh, this is a conundrum. These Calvinistic scholars struggle with this. Oh, well, we believe that God only chose some and that those some are the only ones who can believe and that though everyone else is commanded to believe, they really can't believe and they're already, their damnation is already sealed uh, and yet they're responsible for something they cannot do but they're commanded to do it but they cannot do it and everybody knows they can't do it and God only allows certain. The question is, why not make everyone an object of potential belief? R.C. Sproul, what does he say? Number one, he makes a shocking admission, quote, If some people are not elected unto salvation, then it would seem that God is not at all that loving toward them. (laughs) Well, no kidding. Further, it seems that it would have been more loving of God not to have allowed them to be born. Put the word born. This is R.C. Sproul talking. He is a leading Calvinist. But he admits it would be more loving for, for God to not have allowed them to be born. And then he says that may indeed be the case. Hmm. What a shocking admission. What a shocking... Do you see this God of Calvinism is not the God of the Bible? It's just a whole different thing. Point two, and of course we're talking about the extremists here. Point two, the Gospel is by definition good news. However, the Gospel of Calvinism is only good news to the elect. To all others it is a sentence of death and eternal condemnation in the fires of hell. In the fires of hell. That's exactly what it is. If a man cannot believe, he is incapable of belief. And this is how they just define total depravity as total inability. If he is incapable of belief and if he has never bestowed the grace to believe or the regeneration or the being born, or the being born again to believe, whatever you want to call it, if that never happens to him, then the Gospel is no good news whatsoever. And by the way, you'll remember from a former lecture that Calvinists often equate Calvinism with the Gospel. Now let's go back to this pastor to whom I spoke this past week. This young man that he's had to dismiss now is a Calvinist, a strong Calvinist. This young man would take and would take these viewpoints. This young man would say that Calvinism is the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not. The gospel is whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The gospel is whosoever will let him drink of the water of life freely. The gospel ever is whosoever will may come. And let me say that any doctrine that takes the whosoever out of your Bible ought to be just chucked in the trash can because it's not a scriptural doctrine. There is not anyone in this world that cannot be saved by placing their faith and trust in Christ. Point three, according to John 12 and verse 32, where the gospel is preached, all men are drawn to Christ. Although some will resist, all who are drawn will have the opportunity and ability to believe. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. What is the lifting up there? The lifting up is His being lifted up on Calvary's cross. What is the drawing power? As the Gospel is preached, men are drawn to Christ. Now hear me, there are some that resist. There are some that say no. There are some that refuse the pleadings of the Gospel message. There are some that turn their back on it and they do so to their eternal peril. And should they turn their back on it continuously and die in that condition, they will spend an eternity in hell. There is no question about that. And there are others that are saved. But all can be saved and all are drawn. The Bible says God's no respecter of persons. The Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I don't have time to deal with it, but Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 28, this is the preaching of the Apostle Paul. It plainly teaches that God desires all to be saved and that God has so ordered history that men might seek the Lord. If happily they may seek the Lord and be found of Him. Acts chapter 17. You say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying this. I believe in the sinfulness of man. The Bible teaches it. I believe that man is a sinner by nature and a sinner by choice. I believe that because of man's sin, he cannot do anything to please a holy and a just God. There is nothing that we can do to earn our salvation or a position of righteous standing with God. There is nothing that I can do to clean up my act and impress God, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. I have missed the mark. I have fallen short. And I am a sinner. I understand that. But... 
But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I am a sinner who heard that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, who heard that though I am because of my sin I'd be barred from the presence of God in heaven, but that God loved me so much He sent Christ to die. Christ died for my sins. By simple faith in Jesus Christ, I am saved. And I'm a Christian not because there's anything good in me, but because there's everything good in Jesus. And I now, as a saved, born-again Christian, go without any twinge of conscience whatsoever, and I tell somebody lost, as I did today, a man who didn't know Christ as far as I could tell, and I said, look, if you'll turn to Christ, you can be saved. Let me ask you a question. Was I lying to that man? No, I wasn't lying to him. If I was a Calvinist, I, I would have had to say, if you're one of the elect... You could be saved. In fact, if you're a Calvinist, you'd say, if you're one of the elect, you're going to be saved whether I talk to you or not. So why bother? That's exactly what they believe. We'll get to that in just a little bit. When I offer salvation to someone and say anyone can believe, that's not a sham. It's not a phony. It's the invitation of God. Why? You say, preacher, why, why is that? Because the nature of God, He loves us in spite of our sin. And God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, it clears up so much of theology sometimes, and we thank You, Lord, for that. And I pray, Father, that You would just bless us in this study. Lord, it's a wonderful thing to know that as we witness the Gospel to folks, we can make a sincere promise that if they'll turn in saving faith, they'll be accepted of Thee. Thank You, Lord, for making salvation so clear, so simple. Lord, it cost a great price, the blood of the Lord Jesus. And yet You've opened the doors that all may come. Make us faithful witnesses to the Gospel. Help us, Lord, by our efforts to see folks turn to Christ in faith believing in a Savior who loves Him and died for them. Bless these thoughts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All